pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Pat Hanrahan is a Canon USA professor in the Computer Graphics Laboratory in Computer Science and Electrical Engineering Departments at Stanford University. His research, research focuses on rendering algorithms, graphics processing units, as well as scientific illustration and visual, visualization. As a founding employee at Pixar Animation Studios in the 1980s, Hanrahan was part of the design of the RenderMan interface specification and the RenderMan shading language. More recently, he served as co-founder and chief scientist of Tableau Software and has been involved with several Pixar productions, including to Tin Toy, The Magic Egg, and Toy Story. In 2005, Stanford University was named the first regional visualization and analytics center, where Henry Hans assembled a multidisciplinary team of researchers which are focused on broad-ranging problems in information visualization and visual analytics. So with that, I'd like Great. to welcome Pat. Great, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Can you, can you hear me okay? Is the mic on? Okay, great. Well, it's really a pleasure to be here. I always like to come to Berkeley. It's a little different than Stanford, uh, but in a fun way. So uh, as uh, Yvette said, uh, I mostly do computer graphics. That's my area of specialty. So why am I going to talk to you about data? Uh, well, one reason about 10 or 15, almost 15 years ago, I got interested in, in data analysis. I'll tell you a little bit how I got interested in it. Uh, but it's still been sort of a sidecar project for me. But now it's become sort of a big thing, and I found I have a very different perspective on the problems in data than almost everybody else I've been talking to. And it's sort of given by the title of this talk, People, Data, and Analysis. Now, most times when you hear this topic, you, it's talked about like this. <laughs> it's all about the data, big data. Uh, it's a little bit about analysis. I mean, maybe 10% of the time they say, what do you do with the data and what kind of algorithms you run on it. You know, algorithms are interesting. But even then, it's usually, let's how do you do sorting. It's not like how you do analysis. It's very different than just a, an algorithmic thing. And then every once in a while, they mention people. Like, how do people use data? How should they be using data? So I'm, I'm sort of interested in it in this order. I think it's mostly about people. Actually, it's, I would, I would, I actually, it should be people, analysis, and data. I just said like this sounded a little better to me. But anyway, people, analysis, and data. OK, and I, I, like uh, if I mentioned, I, I founded this company, Tableau, which does data analysis. Now, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm not a computer scientist. I'm a physicist. So I started out in school doing data analysis. In fact, I, I was at the University of Wisconsin and I was in engineering physics, and I worked with a bunch of, my first job there as a freshman was to do a data analysis of experimental uh, physics uh, data of various types. And this was a long time ago, I'm an old person. Uh, you know, we had printouts and paper, and my first job was to plot the data. They would run some experiments, they'd get a bunch of numbers, and we would plot the data. And then of course, I was a physics uh, major, and you know, one of the things you learn in physics, you know, probably, you know, one way, you know, you take, you learn quantitative thinking and experimental techniques. In fact, my advisor at the time was a guy named H. H. Barshall, which was one of the great uh, experimental physicists that discovered a lot of the properties of neutrons, that, and he worked on the Manhattan Project. And he was a hardcore physicist. He didn't trust any theory at all. Okay, he, he just said if you couldn't experimentally validate something, it just wasn't worth even thinking about. And I eventually got a degree in biophysics, and I had an even more extreme experimentalist as an advisor. So even when I was in grad school, it was all about doing experiments and analyzing that. So that's sort of, I mean, it's a little bit my perspective. I know it's very, very old-fashioned. Nobody cares about scientific method and how to do experiments. But anyways, that's where I'm coming from. So, uh, so anyways, and that was a book I used, Data Reduction Analysis, Air Analysis for the Physical Science. By the way, it's a really good book. You should read that book really old, I still have that book. Uh, so anyways, that's, what I, that's where I'm coming from. Now, just to fast forward a little bit, how do people think about data and data science? You know, I'm sure this is a hot topic at Berkeley, it seems to be you know, it's sort of, I think it's sort of epitomized right now how other people think about data is sort of by this Net Pro, Netflix prize team. Or I think even better, you know, going back a little bit longer to like the quants on Wall Street, right? You know, uh, David Shaw type people, you know, do hedge fund trading, computer trading, and so on. And you know, you, just, you sort of get a, an MO of these people, right? They tend to be a bunch of applied math, PhDs in math type guys, and maybe some hardcore computer scientists and machine learning and systems people thrown into the mix, right? That's sort of the sort of typical popular uh, view of a 
Uh, that's, and the thing they work on is like how to improve uh, recommendations, say, for movies. And probably the other big thing I think that's where we think about when we think about data science, which I think is pretty awesome, is this Watson project, right? The idea that this computer could beat humans at Jeopardy, right? That's pretty amazing. In fact, I, I still am sort of stunned that they could do that, right? I mean, this computer can answer these questions in real time using speech and natural language processing. Uh, it's pretty stunning. And so, you know, if you go to IBM right now, they think they're going to sell Watson, and Watson is going to do all the data analysis for us. It's a big thing right now, right? You're going to hand over your business to Watson, and it's going to tell you how to run your business. Or if you're a doctor, you're going to have this Watson assistant, and it's going to tell you how to make diagnoses. And so that's, that's the future, in some sense, that people are painting. Now, there's one thing about these two cases that I want you to think about. These were both recommendation systems. Recommendations. <laughs> if somebody pops up an ad on Google, or they recommend a movie or a book, you know, you might once in a while uh, like that recommendation and buy the book or watch the movie. But it's a recommendation. It didn't tell you to watch the movie. It didn't order you to watch the movie that night. That's a very different context for doing data analysis than what I did as a physicist or what a lot of people in the real world do, right? If you think of somebody that has a real problem to solve with data, you know, when Governor Christie had to evacuate New Jersey before Hurricane Sandy a couple years ago, that was a really big decision to make. And he was getting lots of recommendations, of course, by other people, but he had to make the decision. And if he made the wrong decision, you know, millions of people could have been injured and lots of property damage that could have been avoided. And by the way, this is sort of interesting. This was sort of the data that he had. These were the predicted paths. So think of these as the recommended paths, the predictions of the various paths of the hurricane. And the way they do this is they have like 20 different simulations, and they just run them, and they all give different answers. They're just computer programs. Nobody, nobody can validate a simulation that predicts the path of a hurricane. You know, they can't predict that to like one meter accuracy, right? Those are all the real predictions. And most of them are just going out into the ocean and aren't even hitting New Jersey. In fact, there's only a couple that hit New Jersey, you know? And by the way, this I think is a pretty good visualization because it actually shows you what information they actually had, which was a bunch of these predicted paths from a bunch of different programs. And I doubt if Governor Christie knew the difference between one program and the other, but he had you make this call. That's the way people tend to often use data, I think, in the real world. And a lot of people, when they use data, are using it to answer really serious questions. They're not just using it to make recommendations. You know, should we leave our home if we're in New Jersey? You know, is this person a threat? I mean, you, you can imagine how often that question gets uh, asked at airports other places around the world. Watson is trying to say, should I undergo chemotherapy? The computer, somebody has to make that decision. They're trying to have a bunch of data. You know, I have some ge genetic makeup, I have a bunch of tests that people have done, various types of clinical trials, but now I have this very personal question, should I undergo chemotherapy? And a lot of the questions we face, you just, I think you have to think about it personally is what kinds of questions are you asking in your day-to-day -day life where you might want to use facts and data? And what do you think are the most important ones and what do you think are the sort of trivial ones? And are computers helping you answer the most important ones? Are they providing you the tools to answer the most important ones? That's the question that I think about a lot almost every day. Now, you might think, and a picture that a lot of people paint, is we're just going to you know, fire up Watson, <laughs> fire up some computer, you know, brain at Google, and it's gonna, we're just going to turn over the world to these computers. And you ask, well, why do people need to be involved in answering these questions? It's sort of obvious. You know, I'm trying to teach a, you know, put together and, and I'm about to teach a course in data analysis, and when I learned data, it was all about the quality of the data, who, made, who did the experiment, why they did the experiment. You know, it's like critical thinking about the data. So if you go and you think about data, ask Watson, is the data incomplete? 
Do we have complete data about this subject? Does that data have any errors? Where are the errors? Is the data biased in any way? You know, did we just collect data about certain types of people? And so on. These are the kinds of things that, as a data analysis, I was trained to talk about and think about, right? These are the things, you know, you, you, have, to, you have to have uncertainty, measurement errors, so on. So these are the kinds of things that people often make because they know stuff about the data the computer doesn't know. They might know, for example, why it was collected and how it was collected. There's a great article about uh, surveillance satellites. A lot of the data we have about the Earth is very much influenced by the pressures of the Cold War and what kinds of sensors they could fly on what aircraft. You know, and if you go just download an image from the internet that was taken from a satellite, you might not know that they had some agreement that they couldn't sense in this band, right? But a person might know that, right? An analyst would know that. So they would know that data might be incomplete in that band. And by the way, if they were looking for something in, that had a signature in that band, you know, they would know that the data doesn't have that information in that band. And that's why a person might be involved in a decision like that. And of course, a lot of these decisions, I think that most of the interesting decisions, often involve ethical judgments or judgments that impact people in ways that computers just really haven't quite got to, right? They don't really know what matters to us or not. So I, I don't need to dwell on this, I think, too long, but I, I'm only going through this, which I think is a fairly obvious set of points, but nobody talks about people and how data is used by people. And we just have to keep this in perspective. Now, on the other hand, you just flip it around a little bit, and this is something I didn't really appreciate until I started Tableau, is how do people in the real world use data? You know, I mean, Actually, how many people here actually do data analysis regularly? Oh, good. Pretty, I'd say that's pretty much, I'd say 10% maybe. I mean, it's, it's not a high percentage. How many of you work on data, data analysis, big data, or whatever? Pretty much, okay, similar, okay. I've been in rooms where everybody's working on big data and nobody's ever analyzed data. <laughs> but uh, anyway, if you go out in the real world, um, there's a lot of people doing data analysis every day. It's actually sort of surprising. In my estimation, most companies are much more quantitative and data-driven than universities, enormously more. You know, it, it, I think it's just because they, you know, they, they're, they're, they're living on little tiny margins, right? If you're at Walmart, you're living on a 2% margin. You know, Stafford and Berkeley, I don't know, maybe we're probably a little bigger margin than you, but, you know, uh, <laughs> we, we uh, you know, we don't live on a 2% margin, I don't think, right? I mean, we, you know, we, we get a lot of money donated to us and so on. So we don't live on the edge like most companies do, okay? So eBay and Zynga, I just picked up two examples. You know, uh, eBay, they have all these categories. Doll collectors, coin collectors, stamp collectors, gun collectors, old radio collectors, you know, all the stuff you can buy on eBay. And they have what they have these category managers. So there's a category manager at eBay, you can try to picture who this person is and what they know and you know, what they think about every day. And they monitor the Barbie sales on their website. And every once in a while, they notice something like the price of Barbie dolls just went way up. Well, what happened? You know, is somebody doing something fraudulent? Is some guy in Russia really interested in Barbie dolls? I mean, you know, what's going on here? And they have to respond. Their job is to monitor their business, right? They have to respond. If something fraud's going on, they got to figure out how to prevent it. If there's some trend that's going on, like maybe Barbie dolls are getting really hot because of some TV show or something, maybe they want to capitalize it, start running ads, you know, all these things. That's what they do. That's how they make money. So you have this doll collector, and they get a dump of all the transactions on their website every day involving all the goods that are for sale, who bought them, so on, and they have to analyze that and react. And there's another person that might be doing, say, stamps. And I can just tell you the stamp market is completely different than the Barbie doll market. You know, I mean, you know, if I figure it out, right? Just the kinds of people that buy stamps and the history of stamps and what makes a stamp valuable and so on, it's just completely different. And so the person doing the stamp analysis has to be, have completely different knowledge and often, things that happen in the stat market would never happen in the Barbie doll market and vice versa. 
And these collector, these people that run these categories are, have unbelievable expertise. Right? Imagine you go to some flea market and you run into one of these. I mean, they have unbelievable expertise in this particular area. So, so that's a typical person doing data analysis at eBay, and there's probably like 5,000 of them. Zynga, game company, like I, I, you know, I can't believe how quantitative game production has become. I mean, you know, Zynga really revolutionized games because they literally turned their games over daily. They, they would look at what was, how the gameplay was proceeding, and they would change the game to make more money. You know, like people decided they didn't like the game, maybe they all got killed at one place, or you know, all the things that can happen in games. People never used to know what happened in games. Like some games could be boring and people would just stop playing and they wouldn't even know it, right? They'd just ship the game and they wouldn't even know it. Zynga just said, let us we could watch people play the games. And not only that, we're making money by selling these virtual goods. Let's encourage gameplay that encourages people to buy more virtual goods and we'll make more money. So completely data-driven game production, and so who's doing this? The people designing the games, right? The individual producers and game uh, player, or, or, you know, game uh, software developers are looking at the data every day and adapting the games. And again, they're, I'll just start saying, they're not you know, uh, data scientists. They're people that make games and try to uh, make them fun. And this goes on and on. I mean, the point, the point I guess I want to make about this is I've just been sort of done by the number of ordinary people that analyze data every day. You know, I mean, just think of even the, the, some of you raised your hand, maybe 10%. How many other you, of you get a spreadsheet with a bunch of numbers in it once a week or something like that? Right? Almost everybody gets data about things they're interested in every day. So that's a big trend. And, you know, uh, I don't know if Hal is here, but, you know, He's written a bunch of stuff like data science is sexy and so on. But this is my favorite thing he's written. You know, the ability to take data, to be able to understand it, to process it, to extract value from it, to visualize it, to communicate it's going to be the hugely important skill in the next decades. Not only at the professional level, but even at the educational level. So elementary school kids, high school kids, college kids. Because now we really do have essentially free and ubiquitous data. So the scarce resource, the ability to understand the data and extract value from it. I think that just captures the situation sort of exactly. And further, he says, I think statistics is part of it, or statistics, but it's just a part. We can estimate what it is. I think it's about 10%. You have to do all these other things uh, to use data effectively. So I, I, I go through this, this, this part because, and I think that we're just not serving the regular people of the world that work with data. If you look at what we do in data science education, we're going after these PhDs or masters. I don't know how many programs have been set up to teach data science for masters. How many have really tried to revolutionize the data analytical skills of freshmen and sophomores? Right? We're not serving these people. And in the world of big data startups, there's almost nobody serving these data enthusiast types. Now, why do I call them data enthusiasts? I don't quite know the, the, the right term. You know, the, they're different than data scientists in that they don't have PhDs in statistics and they're not great programmers. I think we all know that. I also say they're enthusiasts because I have found that lots of these people are fanatical. <laughs> they're on a mission. <laughs> because what they are, there's, there's a couple of DAO collectors or stamp collectors at eBay that have figured out how to use data to their advantage, or Zynga. And now they're in a bunch of lunatics are around them that don't know what the heck they're doing. They're just making random calls and stuff. And they have a methodology to make decisions. And they think their methodology in using facts and data is going to save the day. This is my theory. Because I meet these people, and they're just these ordinary people, but they just are like totally crazed about using data. I mean, you, know, you have to come, if you've ever come to our customer conference, it is unbelievable how enthused they are to use data to solve problems. You know, it's, it's, it's really fast. Okay, so, so they're a little bit early stage, right? I mean, you have to be enthusiastic right now because none of us have built very good tools for them. <laughs> I, mean, you know, I mean, it's hard work to do this with the tools we have. So you have to be incredibly enthused and think it's going to work. But there's a lot of them out there. I mean, there's... You know, 
you know, tens to hundreds of millions of them out there trying to use data to make the world a better place or their company more successful. Now, suppose you wanted to help these people. Just suppose that, you know, some reason you woke up like I did one day and said, I want to help these people. How would you go about helping them? Well, what did they do? <laughs> yeah, you, first you do, I, I, you know, uh, Mar I see Marty here, so she'll probably object to it. But the first thing I'm going to do if I build tools is I think of who my users are and what they know. Then I think about what they do. You know? So first of all, who they are, the doll collector at eBay. Picture that person. <laughs> or you can pick your version of your own persona. Who that person, this friend, you know, friend of yours that's really in the data but the dial collector, then you figure out what they do. What they do, why are these people data analysts? Is there, turn out they're really good at analytical thinking. Actually, it, I've actually found that most consumer scientists aren't very good at analytical thinking. In fact, I, I've actually looked at GRE scores in analytical thinking are usually pretty low in computer science. You know, you can, well, what is analytical thinking? Like, what, if you're an analyst, and you're trying to track down a problem, you know, like there's fraud going on in your dolls, or your patients are returning from surgery every week. How do you think about that? Well, I th the first thing I think about is you pretend you're Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> you have to be out there as a detective trying to solve the problem. You have to be interested in the question and you have to be trying to figure it out. That's a state of mind. You know what I mean? Sherlock Holmes is a famous character because of his personality. Not just because he solves crimes. He has, he has a personality. He's like crazed about it, right? He, he wants to solve that crime, right? And, and that personality to figure things out, I think, is at the heart of that analysis. So you have to think like Sherlock Holmes. And you know, he, he sort of, you know, I, I always read, I read Sherlock Holmes' book, I always loved him since I was a kid, but I read him like every year. But you know, he has all these great quotes. I, you know, some of you probably heard some of these. You know, it's a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts, right? And then data, data, I can't make bricks without clay, right? You know, to him, like, data is more like clues, right? And for him, finding a clue is really hard. Right? That's why he has a magnifying glass. <laughs> he's, he's out there looking for the clues. And he can be led astray, and he has to put it together. He's, he's out there looking for the clues, right? Now, and the clues are really hard to get. I mean, imagine Sherlock Holmes, if all the clues just came flooding into him like data floods into us without any effort. You know, he'd probably be a little less interested in what he does, but he'd be happy. <laughs> he'd be happy that he had all these clues. Now, he might have to sort them out, but he'd be happy that he has data and clues and facts. Um, and you know, this analytical thinking, you know, I, I've gone through a bunch of doctors in my life. The doctor I have now, the reason I like her is she's a detective. You know, I call her up with a problem. She just doesn't say, oh, you're a 50-year-old so-and-so, go do this. You know, well, what happened? Maybe we should run a test. You know, I looked at your family history and I saw this. You know, she's, she's trying to figure it out. She's just not autopilot through the thing. She's a detective. That's what makes her a good doctor. She's trying to figure out what's wrong with me. And so this mindset is the most important thing you have to convey in analytical thinking. But I, I've tried to come up, this is my, I haven't really seen like a really good definition of it, so I sort of made this one up. Uh, and I'm sure it's debatable, but I say it's a structured approach to answering questions and making decisions based on facts and data. Now that almost sounds trivial. I mean, of course that's what it is. I mean, it's almost, but you know, each of these things are, every one of these lines is really important actually. It's a structured approach. It's not random things you do. Sherlock Holmes doesn't randomly search through London looking for clues. He doesn't randomly walk the streets. There's all these exploration systems you see that seem like random 
exploration. They throw up random pictures. They, you know, there's no structure to it. They just hope, it's wishful thinking that the answer will appear. No, it's not wishful thinking. That doesn't get you, you have to have a structured approach. To answering questions. That goes back to maybe my experimentation history. A question is like a hypothesis. You start with questions. If you don't have a question, you try to do some analysis, you might not get anywhere, right? And then you have to consider how you would use the question answer to make a decision. If, you know, this is sort of obvious, but people forget about it. If you're making a recommendation for a book, you have to do completely different analysis than if you're trying to save somebody's life. Because the consequences of those two things are completely different. So if you don't consider the decision you're making when you're doing your analysis, you're not going to do the right analysis. And then based on facts and data, because you know that's what analytical thinking is, perhaps compared to other type of thinking. So actually, I mean, it's a sort of simple thing, but I would say the top three things are what I often see people not to do. They don't consider the consequences of what they're doing. They don't formulate their questions clearly, and they don't use a structured approach. You know, what's the hardest thing about tracking something down? It's asking the right question. We all know that. <laughs> you know, when, when we talk at a faculty about what we do in grad school, is we teach people how to ask questions. I wish I knew how to just sort of magically teach everybody in the world how to ask the right question. I have no idea how to do it. I think about it a lot. But that's what I do, mostly, is figure out how to ask the right question. Once you get some questions, you start doing this process of analysis. It's like experimentation. In fact, you know, actually I'll just jump ahead. One of the greatest data analysts of the century wrote a great paper which said data analysis is like doing experiments. And if you just substitute it in here, hypothesis here, and then structured approach, you basically have the scientific method. So you have to think about it scientifically, and that's why good data analysts often have some quantitative training in the sciences. Not always, but they at least get the basic idea of the scientific method and how that works. So, so I'm putting together this course, and I'm trying to think of like what you would want every freshman at Stanford or Berkeley to know about this new age of data and how to do analysis in it. Personally, how to do it. You know, not how to hand it off to somebody else to do. How do they should think about handling that. So this is roughly sort of the, some of the things I have. And I'm still, this is still a work in progress. I'm not really happy with it. But you know, normally we think of a certain, few certain things. If we take a statistics course, it's about maybe the last couple things here about how to confirm hypotheses and maybe do causation. But you know, how do you pose questions? You know, you know, when I was in school, you know, well, that's a question, but there's no way you're ever going to answer that with data. So why the heck are you posing that question? You know, how do you have data for it? Is it appropriate data? Is it biased? You know, how do you know if your data is any good? Where do you find data? Who can you trust to provide you with data? How do you verify data that is from unknown sources? Um, lots of times you spend, you find, times find people spend an enormous, practically they spend an enormous amount of time doing these things. Because, you know, it's not worth it for most people to put that in a good form because they don't know the uses of it yet. It's only after you invest in it to put it in a, clean it up and everything. You know it's valuable if you do that. So if you're, trying, if you're on the leading edge, you're often dealing with data that people haven't invested very much in. You know, and a lot of people say, well, we're just going to have to clean up all the data and so it's easily available. Yeah, but that takes a lot of money. So if somebody's on the cutting edge trying to solve a problem that's never been solved, they probably haven't figured out. <laughs> they, don't want, they haven't spent millions of dollars cleaning up the data, right? Um, so you spend a lot of time doing that if you're doing interesting stuff. A lot of data analysis is about contextualizing the data with other data. I'll come back to that. Then you start doing the more exploratory data analysis. You summarize, you learn techniques and statistics, summarize. And then the last two I'll just put, because they're really important, how do you communicate findings with others? And how do you use data to make decisions? And, and how do you convince people rhetorically to make those decisions? And how do you know whether the data supports a complex decision like that? Um, so they, I think these are sort of the kinds of skills you need. And you see there's a little bit of statistics in here, but not a lot. Um, 
I, I sort of see it like a basic skill, you know, just how do you people ordinarily work with data um, and use it in their every day. Now, you know, not everybody will be doing this, but you know, I think, any, you know, just like almost everybody probably touches Excel, everybody will do this sometime uh, if you're a college educated person. So uh, anyway, so, so I'm still working on that, a few ideas on that, uh, but I'm trying to put together this course. This department isn't too happy about it, but uh, I'll figure that out. Okay, so we're technologists. You know, what kinds of things could we do to help? I mean, we want to. Hopefully, I'll convince you. At least you want to help some of these people. You know, uh, you can try to make the world a better place. What you know, what kinds of things could you could you do to help? So when I got interested in this, it was about 12 years ago, I guess, maybe 14 years ago. Um, I just got into Stanford, actually. So I started saying, I was doing all this computer graphics stuff, but I couldn't, couldn't we use graphics and visualization? Like, how do people, so I asked him, how do people do analysis now? And uh, he told me they used Excel. <laughs> and I can safely report today, they still use Excel. 99% <laughs> of all data analysis in the real world is done with Excel. Right? You, you get these things with these tables in Excel. Now, for, you know, make a couple comments on that. And then the next step of that is they've, they've, they do these things called pivot tables, cross tabs, which some of you may know about. You know, a lot of people don't even do that. Uh, but anyways, two things about this, and I'm not trying to rag on Excel. Excel is a great product, but it was not designed for data analysis. <laughs> this was an afterthought, <laughs> right? If you read the story of Excel, it was designed to make spreadsheets for financial calculations, right? Like financial reports. It was not designed to have a million rows of data in a spreadsheet. In fact, you know, it's almost insane, right? I mean, how would you go around and edit a million rows of data in Excel? Just, you know, it's, it, the metaphor of how you program Excel and manipulate things in Excel doesn't scale up to millions of rows of data. But, you know, because it represents tables well, it became sort of scaffolding to let people sort of get access to data, and they started using it uh, to do data analysis. So, uh, so anyway, that, that's sort of interesting. But anyway, that's pretty much the state of the art right now. If you're trying to do data analysis, uh, you use Excel. Uh, it's changing slowly, but uh, it's a very few people that you know use other types of tools. Okay, now. I was trying to think about how to build visualization software for data like that. Like I sort of had this idea that, you know, imagine, you know, in graphics we have these databases like the Earth, like Google Earth, and I wanted to, you know, we can draw them and visualize them and play games in those virtual world. Like suppose you wanted to create sort of the virtual world game engine for data, you know, and then you could sort of see it and manipulate it. It was sort of a crazy idea. And I actually, it was a really crazy idea because you know, you might think, if, you, if I just told you that, that you should build a planet of the Earth and put a bunch of 3D bar charts on it. <laughs> you could take that very literally and try to do that. And by the way, that was done uh, many times. Uh, that's not a good idea. So I didn't make any progress on it until I started working with Barbara Traversky and a bunch of cognitive scientists. And I just want to tell you this about this one paper, because I think, uh, this is just my personal experience, once I figured out this one paper, then I actually had some ideas about how to make progress. And it's a really great paper. Why is a picture sometimes worth 10,000 words? And this was published a long time ago by, you know, a hero of our field, uh, Herb Simon, but who also, of course, won the Nobel Prize in, in economics for decision making, which is interesting. Right? Uh, but anyways, he, he talks about something called the representation effect. So if you try to do, you look up visualization in psychology, they always talk about multiple representations. So they say a diagram is one representation, text is another representation. You know, there's different representations of things, and visualizations are just different. But anyway, here's this example that I still like because once I real, figured this example out, it made it clear to me. It's suppose somebody looks at an Excel table and it has some statistics about sales and profit for different products like coffees and teas in different regions. And this is a typical thing people do, do every day. Uh, you can ask the question, how much mint tea was sold in the West? That's a question. Now you can ask, how long does it take you to answer that question? And it turns out 
This table is actually quite brilliant <laughs> because uh, there's two things. It, the, the headers are alphabetical. So when things are alphabetized or sorted, you can use a very nice algorithm called binary search, <laughs> which is quite nice. That means it takes logarithmic time. And furthermore, this set of headers is hierarchically organized. And so you can also do, you have a tree there, and you can not use binary search, but you can use tree search. So you can first figure out which one I'm in, and then you can drill down. So you, and the basic point is you don't have to do it in linear time. So you can do sort of it in logarithmic time. And so you can look up you know, west quickly. Now, I mean, this is a simple example of only four, but you can look up west quickly and mint t quickly and look it up. And tables are indexing structures. They're indexers, they're indexers and they actually work very well. And you know, Simon and Newell, they thought a lot about the mind as sort of a computer, and they would actually break this down into visual primitives, and they would sort of tell you that you could calculate this answer to this question given this representation in a certain amount of time. And it would be very efficient. Um, just same table, you change the question just slightly. What product in what region sold the most? What product in what region sold the most? Wow, that's impressive. <laughs> Everybody see that? Now they told you where it was. This doesn't work very well, except for Jatendra. And the reason is, <laughs> is you have to scan all the entries in the table. And so that takes linear time. But more, it's even harder than that. As you scan, you have to remember the maximum, and you have to compare the current value you're looking at to the maximum. And you can forget the maximum, and you can start, have to start all over again. And so if you actually do this experiment on a bigger table, it, it, some people, times people can't even finish it because their error rate is such that they, you know, if you scale this table up to have 10 times more data, their error rate would be higher than any successful scan. They'd have to be really disciplined even after. So the problem is with this, is this table doesn't, um, the indexing structure of the table doesn't help you solve the problem. Doesn't, you, can the you can manipulate the table, but, but his argument is that if you have two different questions or two different tasks, the representation that's best for one task is not best for another task. That's the simple question. Uh, and of course, the, it's even better than that. If you change the bar charts, uh, then it becomes completely obvious that Colombian in the east is the, and that takes constant time. So if you remember the whole Newlands and Simon arguments at the time, it's very old-fashioned AI, but they were trying to model the brain as sort of a computer. I mean, not trying to make it run MIPS instructions. It had to use human instructions. But they would actually try to back down how long it would take you to search for various things, how long it would take you to you know, uh, remember something, how long it would take you to calculate something. And then they would analyze these things. That What that paper does, uh, that, that one is award, you know, best paper in kind of science. What it basically did is built this model that predicted how long these different representations would take people to solve problems. And the key thing about this is, the, is that it matters what the representation is. <laughs> and it has to be matched to the question. And so you can't design a visualization that's really effective unless you know what it's going to be used. And there's no one super visualization that's going to solve every problem. Right? Because if you ask a different question, the table's no good. You have to resort it. So, so you need the flexibility to have a manipula the visualizations get sort of designed on the fly to answer the questions that you're trying to answer. Anyway, this is, this is, I, I'm just telling you this because it's not about going into 3D. It's not about, it's about analyzing how people read these visualizations at some level of detail and how they actually use them to solve problems. So, you know, the original article, the original book on, on information visualization was titled Using Vision to Think. But people have forgot about it and they don't think about how we visual, how do we use, solve problems explicitly with the visualization. What do we do? So I, I've actually done a lot of work with eye tracking and so on. It's really interesting to see what people do when they look at these things. It's not, they don't, you know, most people say, you read all these reports, when you have visualization, it's like this fire hose of data going into your mind. No. <laughs> 
It's a fire hose without it going to your mind and get dropped on the floor. <laughs> it's only when you look at something do you ever get any information. Now, some things are like pretty attentive as fast, but you really have to design these things well. And, and the final comment I'll just make is visualization can be really valuable if you have the right representation, but just as it's easy to have a good representation that makes something effortless, you can design a bad representation that can make people unbelievably bad at anything. <laughs> so imagine you want to draw a network of all your friends and you draw a hairball graph in front of them and you ask them to trace paths. Have you ever tried to trace paths in a hairball? Have you ever tried to untangle a cord? That's really hard. <laughs> You know, so just because somebody knows how to draw, draw giant graph drawings of hairballs of blah, 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 that can make people's life arbitrarily miserable because we're no good at tracing paths in hairballs. So I mean, you just have to realize that, that you can make really bad visualizations. In fact, it's very humbling to watch people read visualizations because things that you think are so easy are so hard. You have to be humbled by that to make good visualization. Watch somebody read a map someday. So anyway, when, 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 when that was the perspective. So the, two, the perspectives that when I did Tableau, I'll just show, I'm not going to talk about that too much. But we wanted to be able to design almost all common visualizations. So our starting point was simple visualizations were better than complex visualizations because people understood them. And you just had to make the right one as quickly as possible. That was the basic idea. So there's no one visualization. And I'll also mention one other thing. A lot of people think tables aren't visualizations. Tables are great visualizations. They're not the right one all the time, but they can be great visualizations. You don't want to build a visualization system and say, oh, tables aren't visualizations. You know, a visualization, if you see it, it's a visualization. Very simple definition. Um, now, there's, so, so Chris, we did this thing. So there's one other thing. So we, we, when we did this table, I just want to tell you one other thing about this because it turned out to be really important and not many people have tried to do, is what he did is he designed a drag and drop interface that was supposed to be accessible to Excel users, and you could design these visualizations like this. Um, and uh, the one thing I want to tell you, and so what it was based on is you would drag these things over here, and you would, you would create this sort of like query language that would define the visualization. So what you would do is if you want to make this side-by-side -side map, you'd, you know, you'd drag like uh, you know, the two candidates, or this is an old example, two candidates there, and then you'd drag the, the total donations by zip code into there, and, and you'd sort of get something that looked like this. Like, you'd say candidate and longitude on x-axis, right? Candidate, there are two candidates, therefore we have two maps, latitude on the y-axis, zip code in each of these panes, party on color, sum of the amount on size, and so on. Um, now, what's important about this, well, first we saw, well, it's really cool, we've designed a visualization. But what's really neat is we also designed a query. We actually also specified a calculation. And I just want to mention that is visualizations aren't interesting unless they let you do stuff with them. You know, a lot of visualizations are read-only things. The most interesting representations in the world are things you can manipulate and write. Programs in math are much more fun than most visualizations because you can do math on the whiteboard. <laughs> You can try to do math with a visualization. It's very hard. There's been some people have done so. But most visualizations are passive. You can't do anything with them. So what, what Chris did is there was this old system called query by example. And it's an ancient system that I remember uh, from grad school. But what he, what this guy's Luf did was show that if you sort of dragged out a, into fields into a table, if you had a table of data and you dragged out some fields into the data, you could formulate a query. And if you read the database books, what was sort of remarkable about this, and I thought this was pretty cool at the time, was he showed that he could make any query with this. That even though it was a graphical representation where you queried by example, it was still complete that all queries were possible. And so that was a big thing that Chris did too, was to show that you could do all the queries you could do by text, some other text thing, with this visual representation. And that's really important because a lot of times when you build tools of this type, what happens is you stop at some point. 
And why is Excel so popular? Because it can do all sorts of calculations that most visualization packages can't. Right? Because eventually what happens is you stop using the visualization because you've got to do some calculation. And then if you can't do it in the visual system, you've got to go back to Excel. Therefore, you spend all your time in Excel because that's where you're doing all the interesting analysis. So, so you've got to make your system more, more, more uh, general. Anyways. Uh, uh, I just, I just want to mention those two things because those two those two principles about the representation effect and making it be a manipulable system is, I think, the most important things about building analytical tools. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll just I only have a couple of minutes. Let me just tell you. I'll just post two things that I think are sort of big challenges to making these things better. Just pick two. I could pick ten, but I'll, I'll just pick the two I think are sort of more interesting that I've been thinking about. Uh, analytical assistance. So one of my favorite books on analysis is this old-fashioned one called Beginning Statistics with Data Analysis by Mostella. This is like written in the 60s. It's really good. I read it again recently. It's just, I, I'm very inspired by it. But anyway, one of, the, one, of, one of the chapters, if you start out with this quote, which is, you may have heard it, but although we often say that data speak for themselves, right? I mean, because most statisticians think, you know, if you have data, you have everything. Solve, you're on your way. But their voices can be soft and sly. <laughs> we need statistics to help them tell their story. Now, I, I, I mentioned that statistics wasn't part of the whole part of the game here, but you know, everybody knows, and I got it drummed into me when I was in school, that you can make mistakes, right? You can be misled by data, right? And you gotta figure out how to avoid those pitfalls, right? Um, the problem is most people don't understand you know, statistical reasoning. So a lot of people, what they do when they want to do statistics is they, 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 they basically just have a, a big dialogue box that let, lets them run a bunch of tests, right? t tests, chi-squared tests. Well, how many, how many of you know, how, you know when, you, when you should apply a t-test and not? Now, some people that take a whole course in research methodology might, but the average doll collector at eBay doesn't even know what a t-test is. So how can you help people, these data enthusiasts, avoid the pitfalls that the statisticians are warning them without having them understand all the math behind a t-test? A lot of people think that's impossible. But I think we could, we could do some simple things that would help them. For, for example, a common thing you might do is you might have some data and you, this is made up, right? but you have some data and you aggregate it and take its average or something or something like that, and uh, it looks very similar. Two data sets look very similar, but these differences are either significant or not significant because the underlying distribution of the data is very different. Well, it might be reasonable to pop up a little thing saying, be wary, this thing you're seeing might not be significant. That be a reasonable thing to do. That's within our power. And with the doubt collector, if, if the doubt and then what you did is you just said, put a little button up there, why, and you popped to this and said the distributions are different. I mean, that that would probably work, I think. It's more complicated than that, but you get the idea. They get the idea is that this the statistics is running in the background, trying to be your assistant to keep you out of trouble. Like, and I, 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 I describe it like that because if I was going to describe it to the doll collector, that's how I would describe it. <laughs> now, I wouldn't describe it to my friend who has a PhD in this, this department like that, but you know, that's the way I would describe it to them. So I think there's tremendous opportunity in this space. It's not about how to use visualization to perform complicated statistical operations, you know, big and giant widgets with lots of controls, which a lot of people are trying to do, or how to have computer-guided machine learning where people have to like figure out why their clustering method is failing. Or, that's not going to be very useful. Doing this, I think, could be tremendously useful. The other problem that is huge right now is data integration. I, I, I mean, I'm, this is getting a little surprised by me, but you know, data integration, probably more money is spent on data integration in the database industry than any other thing by, by a long shot, I think. Everybody knows that. Nobody does anything about it. <laughs> I mean, they just say, yeah, well, or they, they have a hodgepodge of technology. So a couple of things. So why is data integration important? I mentioned this already. 
Jim Gray told me this too. I said, well, what are these data warehousing systems? And you know, you go to the database guys, and they talk about star schemas and blah, blah, blah. And he said, no, what, the reason they work is they provide context. Because what you're doing is you're collecting a bunch of raw data, right? Like you, this is like a transaction at Walmart. You know, what, who bought what at what store when? How much did they pay? How much did they buy? Cash registers do that. Boom, boom, boom. In fact, most sensors do something like that. They give you a little measurement that they've made with some data about when they made it, whatever. You know, if you have a weather station, it tells you the temperature in Portola Valley, where I live, is so and so at this time of day, right? They output a little bit of packet. Just look at that, it's not very useful. But what these guys in the data warehouses figured out was if you join in to these things a bunch of context. For example, the time might be like you know, some Unix time code. If you said, what year is that? What fiscal year is it? What weekday that is? You know, if you have a product, what the SKU is, what brand, what category it is. If you have a store, where is it? If you have a person, tell me a lot about that person. Then when you add in all this context around it, you can analyze this data really effectively. So a lot of data analysis systems, what they do is they, you bring in context or additional factors which are much more predictive about the data than the data itself. If you add in these additional factors, you, you can do tremendous analysis. In fact, most technology and business intelligence is about providing context, providing context for data. Uh, so, so that's really uh, interesting. But notice that a lot of this context is uh, semantically meaningful, right? Or, or very meaningful. It's, it's not just random joins, it's meaningful joins, right? What do people care about, right? Like they care about their fiscal year because in their company, that's what the calculations determine. One company might have a different fiscal year than another company and so on. They care about the types of their stores. They have set up ontologies for their products. They've created a mental model of their business. They've created a mental model of their business that lets them think about their business. And that's what they do. They create a mental model and then they analyze the data within the context of their mental model. Anyway, so you can't do data integration without understanding the semantics. I'll just claim that. That seems obvious to me. Um, and semantics involves people, right? Semantics isn't arbitrary. <laughs> it, you know, you have to, it's, it's, it involves people. And so I claim you need to have people involved in lots of stages in data integration. And that's completely unexplored almost, completely unexplored. It's how to let people very easily integrate data, enhance its meaning, and make all the judgments that they know about what it means, and let the computer assist them in various ways but then let that data come join together in a meaningful way. Uh, so the, I, I think that's by far the biggest challenge to doing more advanced analysis for people. So I'm almost done, but I, I hope this is a fairly simple message. People data analysis. There's a lot of people out there with really interesting questions that are also passionate about answering them. That's what's so fun about working with them. You know, they want to answer those questions. They're excellent analytical thinkers with deep knowledge, but they're not programmers or statisticians. Data, it's not about big data, it's about data everywhere. The fact that there's big data is the least interesting part because there's only a few of those. <laughs> the fact that data is everywhere is what's important. But that's good because Sherlock Holmes would have loved, we can make a lot more Sherlock Holmes now than we could in the past. And actually, this is a pretty big personal motivation for me, just because I grew up as a scientist. I'd rather have the world make more decisions based on facts and reason. Just sort of, not that all decisions should be based on facts and reason, but it would be nice if more were. And then this part, yeah, we have a few tools here, but to be honest, everybody in the world is still using Excel. Who's going to come up with something that's better than Excel that helps people do this? Who's going to do that? You know, 10 years ago, we were all talking about who's going to come up with something better than the normal graphical user interface? And it sat there for like 15 years or 20 years. Nobody did anything. Then Apple came out with the iPad and the iPhone. And at least they got us to the next step, I would say. Think of that for data analysis. We've been stuck here for about 20 or 30 years in Excel. Who's going to start building some tools that 
will be the next generation of tools that will get us to the next step. So that seems like a very interesting question. So with that, I'll end. Thank you very much. So do we have any questions? Here you go. I have a problem with the central bullet there. Data, everyone will be working with data. More decisions based on facts and reason. The question is, what data will people choose? Suppose you're a politician, you have to make some decisions about global warming, the economy, and so on. You could use the scientific data, or you could use the data that tells you whether you're gonna be re-elected or not. Yep. Or you're gonna use the data whether you're gonna be popular with your party, and you can get data in all of those fields. But sure. in the end, you still have to then Make a choice which data you're going to use. Absolutely. So not sure we're all well, better off. Data doesn't by itself lead to better decisions. I, I hope I didn't try to mm -hmm. tell you that data by itself, in fact, I don't think data by itself is likely to ever lead to a better decision. People have to learn how to intelligently use data and do analytical thinking with it. So if you want to get a lie with data, you can. But you, know, you can learn to not lie with data, and you can learn to make decisions that are more accurate. So I, I, I mean, I think. That's a danger, but anything that is misapplied, I think, could be dangerous. Yeah. Right. Um, so you talk a lot about the importance of data analysis, and uh, I think there are sort of two different things you can do with data. One is sort of analyzing data, and the other is making predictions yep. from the data. And a lot of people in the social sciences are more concerned about analyzing the data and. Um, so they are basically, they don't care about the model as much, but they do care about the consistency of their estimators and they care about the science of their parameter estimates, not the actual values. Whereas in machine learning, uh, people generally, uh, you know, they care about making predictions directly from the data and they worry a lot about uh, making the model flexible enough to fit the data and uh, they actually do care a lot about uh, the exact value of your parameter estimates. So um, in your view, do you think uh, sort of analyzing the data is a more fundamental and a more important problem than, say, making predictions from the data? As a person, it is for to be. I guess that was my point. Now, it doesn't mean machine learning technologies aren't unbelievably valuable. But you know, when you have these complex decisions that you'd like to use facts and data for, machine learning won't work, right? Right. I mean, I think I, I hope you'll agree with that. Right. If not, we can talk about half long. But you know. They don't make complex decisions right now. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I don't think you want them to. Right. So now they might get better. You know, maybe they'll get smart enough to be able to handle lots of the things like you know, all the things I talked about. But right now they aren't there. They're, you know, they can get to the level that maybe they can recognize a face in an image or they can you know, make a movie recommendation, but they can't do the complicated things that I see people do every day. Right. So, so for those large classes of problems, you know, the, if you look at the classes of problems that's being applied to, it's pretty narrow, actually. It's mostly by big companies, retail, very simple recommendations. Mm -hmm. machine learning. You look at, there's this long tail of other types of questions, people, and it doesn't work for those. Right. So, so you know, what the total area under these curves are, I'm not sure. But you know, there's still value, I think, in answering these other questions, mm -hmm. these more complex questions that we make as a society and as a person that you'd like to use data for. So right. that, that's sort of my interest, I interest in it. But I, I tell you, I'm, by the way, I'm in the minority, by sure. <laughs> I'm the one in the thousand here. But you know, that's, where, that's my point of view on it, is that recommendations are very different than analysis. Correlation is not causation. Right. Um, so one can always uh, also argue that you know, making predictions directly from the data eliminates sort of the cognitive biases uh, that people yep. have. And that might be actually a better approach than you know just analyzing the data and taking sort of the results of the analysis yep. and making the decisions yeah, themselves. So, so it would be really good if, you, and I think that's a great point. I like that point. So, if, if, and I and I would be all for that because then I would say if you could show that using data in this way would eliminate human biases and make the world a better place, I'd be all for it. <laughs> if you just say it as an abstract, I mean, you have to show me that, right? You have mm -hmm. to show me that, you know that these biases were so strong, right. and there's been some studies on that, these biases are so strong that you'd be better off doing it this other way, uh -huh. and people would think things would be fair. And so on. I, that, I love that argument, I'd be right. completely behind that. If you don't do the study o and show that it works, right, it actually eliminates biases or doesn't introduce other problems, right, mm -hmm. then 
you, know, you have to go the whole nine yards on that, right? You can't just say theoretically it could eliminate biases. You have to go the whole nine yards and say, yeah, there are biases. I've proven, and that's analysis. <laughs> so in order to get your machine learning technique out in the world to do that, you have to analyze it right. and convince everybody that that is in fact true. Right. That's the difference between analysis and machine learning. Do you have a question here? Yeah. Oh, thanks for the talk. Um, what's the relationship between your notion of analytical uh, thinking and exploratory data analysis? How do you see those two concepts related? Yeah, so I, I, I mean, you know, I'm a big fan of Tukey, and I like what he calls exploratory data analysis. I don't think that's what most people think of as exploratory data analysis, you know. I mean, to him, it's still structured. You know, he still says, you know, so, a lot of, so the question is just what do you do when, right? You know what I mean? So, like, so when you just take away the word, right, what do you do? Like, you make some summary plot, you, you have some descriptive statistics, you Maybe look at it in a couple different ways. I mean, there's various techniques, but I think he thinks of it as very structured. A lot of people that seem to exploratory just sort of, the main problem I have with it is it seems very unstructured. And that could be okay, you could get lucky, but to him it's a very, so exploratory analysis usually means that um, your questions are more general, uh, they're often doing things like checking and verifying, so I would call that exploratory data. So a very common thing I do as an example is if somebody gives me some new data, I spend a lot of time checking it and verifying it, and I would call that exploratory data analysis. Because by having a rigorous methodology for checking and verifying it, I get familiar with the data, and I get confidence in what's good about it and what's bad about it. So I would call that still exploratory, because I'm still in the early stages of analysis. Well, what would you call something like, say, you're a reporter, and you have a data set, say, about city government, and you, you're trying to just it's not like uh, you have a murder that you're trying to solve, say, with the Sherlock Holmes analogy, but rather you're just trying to see is there anything irregular going on in this government, say, which is what I think of, say, more. Yeah, yeah, so, so that, 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 that's what I think most people think of it. But I actually spent a lot of time with the report. I just gave a talk to at Stafford. They're all doing stories. They all have stories they're trying to tell. You know, they're not in that state of mind, you know what I mean? I mean, you know, maybe once in a while they wonder about what the next story is, but they may look at data to get that, but they're probably, the way they're probably picking their stories is they're picking, like, what are you interested in? You know, what, how, if I had some data about that and I know what these people are doing, how is that going to influence their behavior? They're probably not just randomly looking at the data hoping to find a good story, right? Because, you know, a good story is something that's really meaningful to somebody, right? And you might find something really interesting in the data, but it might not be meaningful to anybody. So why would you go be, I mean, if you're a reporter, you're trying to convey these meaningful stories. So, so I, and I think the same thing happens in science and business. I mean, you know, businesses usually have very specific problems to solve. You know, they're losing money, they're losing employees, like I just saw over at LinkedIn. You know, they, you know are, we, are we hiring enough people? Why are we losing people to Google? You know, it's very specific problems that they've identified are causing them issues. And so they have to track them down. Now they might just randomly in the pro they might see something, but they're usually, I think, spending most of their time answering very specific questions. Right. Okay. Well, um, with that, I just wanted to thank you so much for giving a talk. Thank That's you. A great talk. Thank you.